Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the online research and policy webinars on African development, urbanization, and sustainability, organized by Fondazione Eni Enrico Mattei in collaboration with the Master Design for Development, Architecture, Urban Planning, and Heritage in the Global South, promoted by Politecnico di Milano. I'm Enrico Lippo, Research Fellow at FEM within the research group FACTS, firms and cities towards sustainability. Today, we have Eric Stephen Coker from University of Florida. He will present his working paper, locally developed low-cost particulate matter sensors for modeling PM2.5 in Uganda. This is a joint work with Joel Sematimba and engineer Bruno Mugisha from Makerere University, Uganda. Well, let me briefly introduce our guest. Eric Koger is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental and Global Health at the University of Florida. His research interests are at the intersection of social determinants of health, population susceptibility, environmental chemical exposure, and the investigation of how these factors combine to cause health effects and drive health disparities in maternal and child health. He is particularly interested in studying population in urban environments where numerous social and health inequalities coexist and where people are simultaneously exposed to multiple environmental stressors throughout the life course. His research has focused on the health and developmental effects from prenatal exposure to air pollution and chemical pesticide mixtures as well as joint exposure to the built environment, social deprivation, and air pollution. Let me tell you that Eric will also stop at the end of his presentation to ask well some questions from the audience. You can ask questions writing them in the questions section on the user interface. All right, that's it from my side. I leave the floor to Professor Coker. Eric, feel free to start whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you, Enrico. My namesake. Um, so, as, can everybody see my slides? I hope. Um, yep. So, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, let me go ahead and start. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, really honored to be presenting to you all here. Uh, um, I'm sure most of you over there in the theater. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about locally developed, low-cost particular matter sensor for modeling PM2.5 in Uganda, and um, we'll just get started. So why am I focusing so much on particulate matter? Um, for those unfamiliar with airborne or ambient outdoor particulate matter, it's one of the leading causes of death and disability around the world. So this chart is kind of showing you ambient particulate matter ranks sixth when we compare it to all other uh, risk factors um, that, that we could think of that, that we have data on um, as well as household air pollution ranks pretty high as well and the continent of Africa suffers from both household air pollution and ambient particulate matter so that's why I focus on those two areas in uh, Uganda and um, so what are people dying from mostly how are people affected from ambient particulate matter this graph is showing you mostly it's chronic respiratory diseases, lower respiratory infections, cardiovascular diseases, and some forms of cancer. So um, uh, there's quite a few health effects from ambient particulate matter. It's now established that particulate matter can affect almost every organ system in the body. So what is particulate matter? I think it's important to understand what it is before we talk about the applied approach. So particulate matter um, is a very small, um, particles or liquid droplets and it's kind of a, a, a mixture it can be a mixture of many different things um, it can include dust soil salt smoke ash soot and metals um, and uh, the, the, the whole uh, the reason why it's important from a health standpoint is some of these particulates can be very toxic to the human body and some of the particulates can be very small as you can see here um, uh, it, that uh, large tubular looking thing, uh, imagine that's a, a strand of hair, some of it's human hair, and then we see a fine beach sand. And PM2.5 um, uh, compared to a, a human hair is extremely small, and that's what this picture is trying to show. 
And the reason why that's important is the smaller the particles, the deeper it can go um, inside the lungs where it can cause injury, irritation, inflammation, um, make you more susceptible to uh, maybe an asthma attack or make you more susceptible to a respiratory infection. Um, and of course, the respiratory system is linked with the um, uh, cardiovascular system. So um, uh, this kind of gives you an idea why we focus on so much on PM 2.5. And the 2.5 refers to um, uh, aerodynamic diameter that is smaller than two micrometers. And um, the sources of particulate matter uh, 2.5 air pollution um, can vary uh, depending on where you are in the world. We can see Western Europe, there's a variety of sources. Uh, much of it is actually unknown. Um, USA, we can see there's a variety of sources. I would say the US is more similar to Western Europe compared to Africa, where you look at Africa and domestic fuel burning, that, that you can see the, the pie chart there. For Africa, um, domestic fuel burning, uh, like using solid fuels for cooking, contributes quite a bit, traffic, of course, and um, as well as industry, and then some other natural sources like dust and, and sea salts um, play, play a really important role in, in, on the continent. But the issue here is in Africa, the data is very poor in terms of actual measurement of air pollution or particulate matter on the ground. This is a satellite image showing you um, uh, what the particulate matter is globally. Um, and you can see here for Africa on the continent, um, there's uh, really, really high levels of particulate matter 2.5. And um, however, while we know this to be the case, that PM2.5 is a problem in Africa, there isn't much ground level monitoring. So those little uh, circles you see there, those all represent um, air monitors uh, throughout Africa and the whole world, basically. Um, our current um, understanding of the, the, the distribution of air monitors. So we can see Europe just kind of littered with many air monitoring instruments. North America, same case. East Asia, Southeast Asia, a lot of air monitoring going on, but there's a big gap in Africa in terms of our real understanding of what's happening on the ground for PM 2.5. And this is what our work, my collaboration is, is kind of uh, working on. Is there. And then another piece of it is, you know, it's still unclear what are the causes of neighborhood outdoor PM 2.5 pollution in many of the urban cities of Africa, um, largely because of this map that you see here where there's this big data gap. Um, is it solid waste combustion? Um, is it, you know, you know people, um, burning their trash, is it roadway dust, household fuel combustion, traffic fuel, uh, fossil fuel combustion, industry, natural sources, unknown sources, high population density. It's actually, there's really no clear um, answer to this for, for Africa's urban cities because the, the, the sources of PM can be so diverse, which is a lot different than what you might see in Italy. So my study is focused in Kampala, uh, which is the capital city of Uganda. I have Uganda kind of noted there. Um, the, the red circle is highlighting where Uganda is. And according to data from the World Health Organization, Kampala has some of the highest levels of PM2.5 in the world. So it's a good place to do this kind of research. Um, and so why is Kampala um, so heavily affected? This is a, um, a typical image that you will see in Uganda. In, in, in fact, I know what neighborhood this is, um, but um, uh, you have a, a lot of roadway dust. You, it, densely populated. Um, you have vehicles that, so you have a lot of traffic congestion and vehicles that are very old, working under poor operating conditions, so they're just belching out pollution. Um, and then there's also people cooking with solid fuels. So there's just kind of this mix of different sources and it's a difficult thing to get a handle on to understand what is the, the real sources of the air pollution, which brings me to my collaboration with an organization called AirCo. They're based at Makere University, which is the largest university in Uganda. And they've done some really unique uh, groundbreaking work. Airco has developed the first African-made particulate matter air sensors. Um, and uh, what they've been able to do is, um, so they've been able to um, develop these low cost particulate matter sensors and they've been able to put them throughout schools, um, throughout the area and uh, different um, storefronts throughout uh, Kampala and Uganda, the rest of the country mostly centered in urban areas and they've been able to um, you know send all this data to a cloud and they've developed an app so that people can 
you know, see if the air quality is good or not on a particular on any given day. And all of this data is uploaded in real time. And this is all stuff that they've done on their own. Um, and so it's some really groundbreaking work, and they've received some funding from Google AI to um, kind of expand their monitoring network and to use artificial intelligence to uh, uh, understand the air pollution problems in Uganda. Um, and they've even put these devices on um, motorcycle taxis to do mobile monitoring throughout Kampala. So I've gone out there and worked with these folks and we've um, worked together to identify locations, storefronts, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, places that we can place these monitors to get a good distribution of these monitors throughout the city of Kampala. Um, so, uh, thinking back to that map I showed you of Africa and how there were hardly any air monitors, well, because of the work that AirCo has done for Uganda, you can see now the spatial coverage for air monitoring throughout the country is, is quite extensive. Um, compared to just a, a couple of years ago when there was just one air monitor at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Kampala, and that was basically the only real air monitoring going on in the country in a systematic way. And so now they've expanded this um, where they have well over uh, 50 air monitors throughout the country. And then focusing just on Kampala, where my study is focused, we can see now they have upwards of um, 30 uh, air monitors uh, throughout the city of Kampala. So they've really done an amazing job. And so this is um, the folks that I'm working with in Kampala. So this brings me to my uh, uh, my question of, um, you know, we need to be able to model these, um, uh, the, the distribution of particular matter in these urban settings. Um, so just coming back to this map real quick, like, you know, it looks like there's good spatial coverage and, and there's pretty good spatial coverage for these air monitors. There's obviously spatial gaps where we, where we, we are not monitoring the air, and how do you um, kind of uh, estimate what the air pollution levels in between where there are air monitors? And so there's a few different approaches to doing that. There's science-based modeling, which um, uses kind of the diffusion of air pollutants or particulate matter in the, in, in the air, and then you kind of combine that information with meteorologic information to, to um, develop like a surface of these uh, pollutants. And then there's also geostatistical modeling, which is more spatially explicit or spatio-temporally explicit, such as spatial uh, frigging, uh, inverse distance weighting, those type of methods. Um, and then there's land use regression with mo modeling, which is the focus of this paper. Um, so this, it, it, typically it's involved linear models, uh, where you, you take um, a land use features and characteristics of the um, uh, space, the urban environment, and you use those uh, features to try to predict, to use those as independent variables in a linear model, to predict uh, particulate matter. Um, and so some of these variables will be like satellite remote sensing data of um, green space, for instance, uh, land use designations, um, the, the distribution of roadways and vehicle traffic, and then population density. These are some examples of the independent variables that you would use for this uh, linear model. Um, and then uh, you combine that um, independent data with the dependent variable data, which is your ground level air monitoring data, in this case, PM2.5 from the AIRCO group that I've been talking about. Um, and then you do cross validation to validate your models. Um, and uh, because you know, you're, you're, you're using this data to predict, uh, but uh, you need some way to understand is, uh, you know, when I predict this data on unseen data, how well does it perform? Um, and then, but there's a lot of challenges with the conventional land use regression linear modeling approach in that there could be nonlinear relationships between your dependent and independent variables. Um, there's multiple correlated predictors, um, which leads to multicollinearity, and there's problems with, with, with um, the, the model fitting. And there's also going to be overfitting of your model because um, you have a whole bunch of predictors. Um, you, kind of, it, it, you can kind of go on and on in terms of the number of predictors you can, you can imagine, um, but you have a very limited number of air monitors, and so overfitting becomes a challenge here. So um, land use regression modeling is great, but it has some major limitations in the way it was originally conceptualized and implemented. Um, which brings me to my paper um, uh, entitled Book We Developed Low Cost Particulate Matter Sensors for Modeling PM2.5, working with folks at AIRCO, uh, Dr. Dana Magisha and, and, and Joel uh, 
send a team back. And this is a paper I'll be presenting in a couple of weeks uh, out of confidence. So the primary research question we have for this paper is, can we use TM measurement data collected from a low cost sensor network that was developed in Uganda to build a land use regression model for PM 2.5? Um, on the surface, this sounds like a pretty simple uh, research question, but it, it, it is like kind of steeped in many different challenges compared to what we would think of and maybe doing this kind of work in Western Europe or North America. Uh, first of all, the major limitation is there's um, there's limited data regarding land use characterization and meteorologic data for the study area. Um, and so um, you really have to go to great lengths to find these types of um, data sets. Um, and some of them have their own limitations, um, more so than what we might be used to. Um, there's uh, a lack of calibration of these sensors because um, although that, that status has changed now because the airco has recently onboarded some of these equipment, but at the time of doing this research, um, uh, there were no other uh, reference monitors to, to compare with. And then there's no preliminary data for the region because, um, you know, like in terms of what predictors should we use for our modeling, there's no preliminary data to base those uh, decisions on. And um, this is challenging because we're dealing with a complex urban environment and there's unknown relationships between the predictors and that particular matter. Um, and this is a very different context than Western Europe or Italy, where a lot of these things have already been established. And then there's different modeling algorithms um, that you can use and their performance can vary depending on location. Some recent work out of India has demonstrated this. Um, so, uh, these are some major challenges, and so this really brings in the approach of machine learning as a, um, perhaps a way to overcome some of these, at least mitigate some of these challenges, maybe not eliminate them altogether. Um, and so the, the whole basic premise with using like, combining language regression and machine learning, this is becoming kind of over the last maybe five or so years, this has become more in vogue. Um, so as, as has machine learning in general. Um, so uh, on the left side of this image, we have our air monitoring data of PM 2.5 for the United States. Um, we have our land use terms, um, you know, things like green space, industry, uh, land use, uh, those types of land use uh, classifications. We have meteorologic variables. We have satellite measurements, such as aerosol optical depth, or maybe um, green, you know, green space, or you know, various satellite measurements you can use. Uh, and then there's chemical transport models, um, model predictions you can incorporate into your modeling. And then you take that to the next level of actually doing your machine learning, where in this case, in this particular study, they were able to predict PM2.5 concentrations for the entire United States um, using um, ensemble modeling. And so what ensemble modeling does is it takes, um, you know, several different uh, algorithms. So in this case, they took neural network, random forest, and gradient boosting, um, and then um, use general additive models to kind of do an, uh, a model averaging to predict uh, PM2.5 surface for the entire United States. And so um, I kind of took this approach. The only thing uh, was I was really lacking was the chem chemical transport model predictions because that data just doesn't exist for the, almost the entire continent of Africa. Uh, whereas these types of data do exist for Western Europe and the United, and the United States. So I was not able to incorporate that data, but I, the, the general approach is what I did for this paper. Just to kind of get you quickly up to speed, uh, for machine learning, there's kind of three broad categories. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, th these things can be parsed out differently, but um, I focused on the supervised learning and specifically the regression-based approaches. Um, so the whole premise behind machine learning is a computer is basically learning the data without explicit programming in kind of a black box sort of way. Um, and the, the, the way it uh, kind of works fundamentally is it's constructing, it's building these algorithms by receiving your input data, which is your independent and dependent variable. Um, it's using statistical analysis approaches to predict um, your outcome, and then these predictions get updated as new data becomes available. And I'll talk about what that new data means, what I mean by that. 
And then um, at the, you can also do these things like the ensemble modeling that I mentioned, which is basically averaging, averaging over your many models that, that, that you've been really using for your machine learning. And then um, you kind of have these model outputs, but then these need to be validated as I was alluding to earlier. And I'll talk about um, how uh, we do that in the emerging machine learning space. So in the context of the land use regression, um, you know, what you need and, and machine learning, what you need to do is you need to be kind of splitting your data into a training set where the, the machine learning is kind of training on, on, on scene data and then a test set, which is data that you hold out of your machine learning uh, algorithms. And um, eventually you would, you would validate your data on that test set. Um, and then um, in terms of the actual uh, machine learning process, um, it typically what is done in the regression space is you do tenfold uh, cross-validation on the training set. And this schematic is kind of showing you how that plays out where you have you know, up to 10 iterations, and it, at each iteration, there is, um, uh, you know, a certain uh, amount of the data that is, is, is that is held out, and 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 you go through that in many different iterations. So that means, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you're kind of getting these validation um, measures within the data that's seen. And so this graph on the right is showing you. The red are the the, the, the the test set, so air monitors that were held out, and the green is showing you air monitors that were kept in the training set. This is just giving an example of how it would be done in the context of um, machine learning for language regression. And then, so what are type of uh, validation measures we can use? Um, I, I'm sure many of you are aware um, there's many different types of validation measures, measurements you can use. Um, uh, so averages, and then um, it sounds like my audio may have been uh, out for a little bit, but um, and then R squared, which um, is basically kind of uh, it, it, like how well does your predictions? Um, uh, Sorry, Eric, uh, you have been you have been freezed for uh, some seconds. C can you repeat uh, from the beginning of the slide, please? The beginning of this slide. Do I need to go back a little bit or no? No, no, just this slide is fine. Yes, okay. we didn't yeah. listen for yeah. several seconds. Um, yeah, sorry about. That. Sometimes the slide with the with the R square is fine. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So R squared, you have um, uh, you know, as we all know, we have um, for our outcome variable, there's generally some uh, net inherent variability, you know, like variance in that, and then also with um, you know, it's basically an indicator of how well your um, set of predictors explains the variability of your outcome variable. It's, it's a kind of a measure of that. And um, at each iteration of the of the training um, uh, algorithm, you're you're getting an RMSE and an R squared um, from your base learner models. And I'm not going to spend too much time, uh, you know, kind of talking about the individual models that I uh, have run because this is kind of a bigger picture look at machine learning, um, but to talk about how I implemented this, I'm just going to dig through some of the R code and, and kind of uh, and, and, and discuss it a little bit. So I used the caret package in R, which is a um, which is a way to um, use multiple machine learning um, algorithms. Um, and it, there's a um, caret ensemble package as well that allows you to kind of do ensemble modeling. So kind of do the model averaging. Um, you know, this is a kind of an exploratory analysis. So I was I used eight different uh, model algorithms, which is probably more than normal. You should probably be using, but because there's virtually no data from the entire continent in terms of, in terms of what algorithms might work you know, best in Africa, urban cities, I kind of did a shotgun approach here. Um, so these included linear modeling, support vector machines with radial basis functions, random forests, quantile random forests. 
extreme gradient uh, boosting, general additive models, lasso, elastic net, regulars, the regularized generalized foot GLM net, um, and then least angle regression. Um, and all of these, um, uh, you know, some are based on linear assumptions of the predictors and the outcome, and some allow for nonlinearity, um, such as the random forests um, and the extreme gradient boosting, as, as example. Um, so we use all these base learner models. Um, uh, I use the, the, the default tuning parameters for each uh, algorithm and when I set it up in the carrot package. Um, and then we use two, two different ensemble modeling approaches to compare with those base learner models. So we use a weighted linear combination of those base learners. Um, and then um, an alternate approach was a weighted GLM net combination because many of these model outputs are kind of highly correlated with one another. And then we assess the, uh, the variable importance. So which predictors tend to be the most important for predicting PM 2.5? So how did I implement this? So the first thing you're, you need to do is you need to split your data. Um, and um, so for doing this, um, you know, first thing I did is I shuffle the data set. So um, this, this first chunk of code here is just showing you how I'm able to kind of rearrange the data set, um, sample from it randomly, and then kind of create a new data set. And then I need to separate out the predictions from the outcome. And so I'm um, creating my X, my set of X variables and my set of Y variables. So my outcome is the Y and my predictors is the X. And then I separate out the training from those variables. I set out, I separate out the training versus the test set uh, for my predictors and outcome. Um, and that's what that next um, uh, data dot create data data partition and subsequent um, uh, lines of code are trying to do. And in this case, um, I chose 90% uh, that are actually going to go into the uh, training set. So um, my outcome variable is the log of PM, and then uh, the P there is just kind of indicating um, the percentage or proportion that are going to be in the training set. So that means 10% are being put into the, the, the test held out set. Um, and then we kind of set up our um, uh, base learner models, the control parameters, and then we actually run the model itself. Um, so the train control is just kind of saying the method is cross-validation. So when it's doing that training, it's, it's, it's doing cross-validation. The number is referring to the number of K folds that we're doing in this case, 10, uh, uh, 10 fold cross-validation. And then the same predictions is basically saying which set of predictions are we um, using? Is it going to be the final? Is it going to be all of them? And then we allow uh, for parallel computing because this can be a little bit, um, uh, you know, computationally intensive. We run our base learner model, um, which will kind of set up these different um, eight different models that I that I mentioned, so that we can do our ensemble modeling. Uh, later on, so model list will kind of have all the output to these eight different models. So we have our X train, Y train. Uh, we have um, uh, the, the the TR control is just referring to those control um, parameters that I set up in the previous line of, line of code. Then we have our different method lists for the different base learner models, and then we have our tune list, which is just kind of set to default. Um, and then continue on fail is just saying false, meaning we don't. We, if, if, if there's a, one of these models fails, we want the model to stop. And then we kind of rescale um, the, the pre-processing of our data. We center and rescale all of our data all at once, our predictor variables. And then how do we evaluate our base learner models? Um, we do that with uh, root mean squared error. Um, so this is just showing you after the model runs, I can, I can I extract all these uh, data elements and put them in a data frame and kind of print them out here. So for instance, let's take the RF here, that's random forest. If the minimum value um, from that training set, um, the, 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 the training output, and, and kind of pull out that root mean squared error. And then this print model results is just showing you, okay, which mod, which base learner models kind of have the lowest RMSD. What we see is um, extreme, so XGBT is extreme gradient boosting. And then GAM is, is the generalized additive model tended to perform the best um, for these um, uh, eight different base learner models. 
Um, so what that's showing is it's these nonlinear approaches um, tend to work best. Um, we can extract out and um, the alpha to R squared. Um, so that's what this line of code is doing. And um, in line with what we saw, we see XGDP and GAM with R squareds of 0 0.904 and 0 0.881 respectively. But the random forest and quantile random forest perform pretty well as, um, as well. So pretty high R squared from that training set. Um, and then we can also kind of map, you know, plot these out where we can resample from that of uh, the different iterations and um, look at the distribution of these um, uh, kind of uh, RMSC and R squared and uh, to, to see how they all compare on a, a single plot. And then um, the, we can do the ensemble modeling, which again is a linear, a weighted linear combination of these different models. So the carrot ensemble line of code here, um, where we, we the metric that we're using is RMSC in terms of um, weighting the different uh, uh, algorithms. And then um, we can get a summary as, as well as plot these. And this red line is showing you that basically um, the weighted combination uh, is basically the, is just as good as the XGB tree um, and very similar to the GAM. So we're not getting much yield out of the uh, on, on, on the ensemble modeling. I also did an alternative approach, which is um, uh, where you can choose the, the, the uh, it's a stack carrot stack approach where you can you, you take all of your modeling algorithms and you uh, assign a specific type of um, uh, modeling approach. In this in this case, I chose GLM Net because many of the model outputs are correlated with another with one another. Um, and what we see is the RMSE is 0.132, and that's basically identical to the XGB tree. Um, so that's the extreme gradient boosting with uh, decision trees. And um, so neither ensemble model seems to be yielding much better than the baseline or the best performing baseline models. Um, so that's great. We've been able to do all that, but we actually need to validate on an external data set. And um, so this is the, the, the code where we can kind of, we can run the, um, the predict.train uh, uh, function, which takes our um, uh, the predicted values from our linear model. And then we say our, uh, our new data is that X test um, uh, data set. Um, and we see how well our X test um, modeling, uh, prediction modeling works. And uh, this is just one way we can um, test the model performance on unseen data, right? Um, and then we can compare the model uh, performance on the held out test set by looking at things like RMSC and R squared. And so that's what this line of code is doing. It's kind of pulling out those predictions and looking at our, um, uh, uh, how well how well it performed, and so we can see the GAM, the generalized additive model, um, far outperformed the ensemble models, or even the XGBT. And so what we conclude from this is basically the GAM is the best performing generalized additive model, which allows for nonlinearity in, in the predictor outcome uh, variables, predictor responses relationship. This is showing you when we, um, uh, so there's the exponentiated uh, values um, and um, what we see is that in this kind of ranking them in order and um, this is what I presented in the paper um, as the GAM model far outperforms every other modeling approach, including the ensemble modeling. When we look at the kind of unseen data, right? And that, which is essentially what we're wanting to do in an epidemiologic, epidemiologic study is we want to predict the values um, where we have no monitoring data. So this is kind of say, what this suggests is that the, the GAM model for this study area might be the best approach. And then we also, I was also interested in looking at variable importance. So I extracted those values from the GAM uh, set. And what this is showing is um, precipitation, uh, green space, roadway density, latitude, and solid fuel use tend to be the, the strongest predictors as well as um, uh, population density seems to be important as well. Um, and many of the other predictors don't seem to play much as much of a role in, or have as much importance in predicting our response variables. 
So just in conclusion, uh, the, machine, the machine learning enabled us to construct a highly predictive model for monthly PM2.5 PM2 concentrations, despite the limited GIS feature data set and only 23, 23 air monitors for the study area. The nonlinear and ensemble models uh, far outperformed the linear regression models. So things like the, the GAN, the XGB tree, the random forest, quantile random forest, these really um, outperform these linear based models. And most of the PM2 point variability, PM2 variability was explained by precipitation, green space, roadway density, household solid fuel use, and latitude and population density. And one thing, just a quick comment on the household solid fuel use. This is the first study to kind of incorporate that type of variable into a land use regression model. And this is really important for the developing country context is uh, take Kampala, 80% of households are using biomass like charcoal or wood for cooking or uh, for cooking at home and um, those pollutants go outdoors and so this is the first model that explicitly takes that kind of data and uses it in a land use regression modeling that proved to be highly important so that's all i have for you and i will kind of stop there i probably went a little bit over my time so i apologize for that i'm happy to take questions at this point Thank you, Eric, for the presentation. Yes, uh, the attendees are invited to make questions using uh, the menu. Uh, in the meanwhile, I have my own question. Um, I, I would like to ask you how this work uh, is uh, related to your current research and how it can be used, for instance, for modeling exposures for uh, a birth course study. Sure, um, good question. I mean, I, I think that kind of brings up, I, I fell bit over my next step just out of okay. time, but um, uh, I, this second bullet point here is I really want to use these preliminary data um, to pursue research funding opportunities for a birth cohort study in Kampala. Um, right now, we've been able to work with AIRCO um, to develop this, you know, they, they provide me these data and I kind of search out these other available data, which are, you know, hard to find for this part of the world, but um, uh, you know, these models, I, I think we've demonstrated, um, can be used for uh, an epidemiologic study. Um, so I would like to be able to establish a birth cohort um, in Kampala to um, uh, assess personal exposures uh, for women, um, at the, uh, uh, pregnant women at the place of residence where they live. And um, so during the prenatal period, and then we can look at birth outcomes, and then we can also follow these children up. Um, and predict these children's exposures um, in early childhood and look at things like respiratory infections and vulnerability. Um, uh, viral respiratory infections are very important in that early, early age group. So those are some research avenues I'd like to be able to pursue. But in, in lieu of that, there's still things that need to be worked out. This first bullet kind of talks, speaks to that is we need to establish some QA and QC uh, calibration procedures using kind of existing um, co-located air monitors um, in, in the study area. And because AIRCO recently um, received funding from Google AI, um, uh, that's over a million dollars, they've been able to really build out their capacity in the last few months um, and where they've purchased reference monitors. Um, and reference monitors, basically, these are equivalent to the US EPA air monitoring devices for, for particulate matter. And so what I'd like to be able to do is incorporate that new data um, and uh, calibrate these, these um, pollutant measurements um, so that these kind of the actual measurements are more uh, externally valid. Um, uh, and so what, the, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to co-locate with their low-cost sensors and uh, looking at um, within instruments variability and looking at between instrument variability and how will they compare with a gold standard. Um, and for the calibrations, we're going to look into, um, you, know, uh, you know, it's been shown that low cost sensors can be calibrated against um, gold standards using uh, reference, uh, I'm sorry, regression based methods where you take into account meteorologic variables. So this is another avenue of research that, um, that, that we want to pursue um, and just to kind of really kind of uh, the idea here is kickstart air pollution epidemiology in the continent of Africa, and that can't be done without low-cost air monitors. 
um, that there, you know, the, the the gold standard reference monitors that Airco just bought are upwards of twenty thousand uh, dollars, can be higher than that, and that's you know most governments in the continent of Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, the, the low-income context, they're not going to be able to purchase these with all the competing priorities that they have to, uh, for government expenditures um, and also research uh, uh, institution expenditures. So these low-cost sensors will help kickstart that, uh, but we need to like validate those, those measurements and we need a modeling approach to um, uh, you know, you harness these data and it looks like machine learning might be that path forward to um, make these predictions in a pretty uh, robust way and um, pretty straightforward way um, in terms of being able to repeat these types of analysis. Okay, thanks. Well, we have another question. Um, in which sense these sensors can be tailored to the region's socioeconomic and environmental context? Okay, that's a good question. So, um, is that a question from you or from the audience? From me. From you. Okay, yeah. So, the, the nice thing here is, you know, most of the material, well, much of the materials to, to kind of build the monitoring instruments were, so, were sourced locally. Um, so, Airco, which um, kind of started maybe like three years ago, um, a very fledgling operation where it was just kind of three people um, uh, from the outset. Um, they uh, they looked at what are some um, components that we can get locally. What stuff do we have to order from like China? What what sensors um, can we order? Um, like Plan Tower ended up being the best sensors to use, and um, and they and, and they build all the computing components and that sort of thing. Uh, but a lot of that was sourced locally, so. Um, in terms of the socioeconomic context, um, you know, the they were able to source things locally, which um, is good in terms of the um, the the supply chain. And then um, those things that were sourced um, externally um, or internationally um, were very low cost um, items. Um, so in terms of the local socioeconomic context, it, it can it can really um, uh, it's, it's buffered in that way. And then when we talk about the local environmental context, these are very dusty environments with a lot of high heat, high humidity. So they've um, been, uh, Airco has been exploring how best to um, uh, maneuver these situations or the, the environmental context. And they've developed ways to filter out these really heavy dust particles um, so that they can really measure the BM 2.5 and these systems won't get clogged with insects and other and you know, debris, that sort of thing. And then um, they've also attached like a little bit of a dehumidifier to, um, first of all, they're able to, they, they've added sensors now that read the humidity in real time, and then they can, uh, uh, you know, adjust um, the either the humid level of humidity or the in our models we can we use those humidity um, measurements and temperature measurements to for calibration purposes. So um, that was something that from the um, they've been trying to build in as they improve the device itself. Um, the, the measurement components um, they've been um, able to kind of uh, address the local environmental context. And the only reason they can do that is because they were they created it locally um, a lot of the low-cost sensors are played were developed in north america western europe uh, new zealand has a, um, a sensor that's actually a very popular or china um, and the, these sensors are not uh, tailored to the local context and but these are and so that's um that, that's why um, it kind of gives it a bit of a leg up i would say so it's really important for us to be able to validate these uh, monitors okay Thanks. We don't have other questions. Okay. So thank you, Eric, for the talk. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having accepted our invitation. Uh, I will also I want also to thank you, my colleagues and the FAM staff for the organization of the event.
and see you, see you in July with the second date of our research and policy webinars on African development, urbanization and sustainability. You can visit our website or our Twitter or Facebook pages to stay up to date with our events. Thank you for watching. Bye. Thank you.